Hello and welcome to this brand new episode of Smart Money. Now, 2022 was a year in which indexing and other traditional investment strategies faltered and a year when quantitative investing offered a bright spot. This week on Smart Money, we do a deep dive in quant investing. Now, quantitative investing uses algorithms to analyze massive amounts of data like valuations, quality, liquidity, yields and the speed of price changes and then systematically makes trades based on this very analysis. By definition, this means that trades are grounded in historical data. How then will this approach fare in a potentially volatile market with few historical precedents in 2023? We have our guest joining us right here in the studio, Siddharth Bora, who's the Head Investment Strategy and Fund Manager PMS at Prabhu Das Liradhar. Siddharth, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me, Sonia. It's an absolute pleasure to have this conversation. It's a pleasure to have you here in the studio, more so because, you know, Quant is known to be the future of investing. Tell us a little bit for a layman, right? Because this is a show of financial literacy. So for a layman, what exactly is quant investing and why is it important? So uh, the way I see it, uh, 20 years back, we asked around people to get somewhere. Navigation didn't happen with Google Maps. It happened if you remembered the roads, if you actually asked people around. What Google Maps did to navigation, quant holds the potential to do that to investing. Because when you're running a quantitative strategy, you don't have to remember everything or rely on your judgment to process vast amounts of data. You can teach your machines how to process data and how to react based on that. So it takes the whole emotion, greed, fear, biases out of the decision making and makes you a very sustainable process driven investor rather than a gut and intuition based uh, investor. So that's the key difference of how we see quant. Google Ma life with Google Maps and life without Google Maps. I can't imagine my life without Google Maps <laughs> exactly, anymore. Exactly, see. So I guess a day and time will come when you won't imagine your life without, without quant investing. Without quantitative investing. But you know, as you said, it removes a lot of the biases and there are so many, right? There's Absolute. behavioral bias, there's familiarity bias. And uh, I mean, there's just simple human emotion that comes into investing. If you want to eliminate that, right. how do you do it? How does quant investing work? So I'll give you an example and then uh, come to this point. So what we see is every investor, active, fundamental driven investor, develops a particular style of investing. And they tend to follow that through and through cycles. In a decade where value has underperformed and growth and quality have outperformed, the human mindset automatically tends to think that, okay, only growth and quality works. But when a regime changes, when the macro monetary valuation regime changes, what we see is that growth in quality starts underperforming mm. and value stocks start outperforming. Mm. So for an active investor, it's very, very hard to change his style. But for a quantitative machine, which is trained to think in terms of regimes, in terms of asset allocation, in terms of styles, in terms of factors, it can evolve itself. And there's not adaptability so much... is what we really look for in quantitative investing. So I guess when you talk about quantitative investing, right, and correct me if I'm wrong, you assess a, a certain trigger based on historical data. Right. When there's not so much historical data available, what do you do at a time like this? So I'm just trying to understand why is it better? You said that quant investing is enabled by vast data, accurate processing power and rules. But if there is not enough data for a particular outcome, then how does it work? So in US, we have data worth 45 years, 40, 45 years. In India, we now have data close to 20 years. Okay. So a decade back, quant might not have picked up. But as of today, where we stand, the availability of data, the availability of technology and the availability of talent mm -hmm. that can blend the technology add its investment insights and create a powerful combination of human insights and uh, quantitative rules. That is the difference where we stand today, that we can blend processes and human insights because there are multiple ways of quantitative investing. Uh, for mathematicians, statisticians who have no knowledge of markets or investment, even they can build quant models. But for them, they are not trying to understand market behavior. Mm. They are trying to solve a mathematical equation. Mm. And we uh, refrain from that method of investing. We follow the quantum mental investing, mm. which is deep rooted in fundamental analysis, technical analysis and logical set of rules mm. rather than solving a mathematical equation or optimize a back test to get better returns. Mm. That is not how we work. And that is the real difference of how today is very different from 10 years ago in India. Okay, tell us a little more. What are the different building blocks? What are the factors that you use in quantum mental investing? So uh, the way we look at it, it's macro factors and equity factors. When we look at macro factors, we're talking about growth, liquidity, risk, 
valuation and trend. These are the five big macro factors that people can use to build asset allocation models. And when we come to equity, uh, there are multiple factors yeah. such as quality, volatility, valuation, momentum, growth, dividend, size, etc. So what all these factors are actually, factors are simply financial characteristics. Mm. When you look at a person, you'll be like, okay, this is a tall person, this is a fair person. So this is exactly what factors help you do. They break down financial securities into financial characteristics. Mm. And when you find a way to convert these financial characteristics into an investment cycle or a decision-making process, that is simply how quant investing works. Okay, I have one fundamental question. I know it may sound silly. But right now, quant investing is working for certain people because they have that edge, right? Right. They know how to make quant models. Exactly. Once everyone starts to know how to make quant models, and how am I going to generate alpha? Okay. So that's a very important question. So let me break it into two segments. Firstly, uh, all the most seasoned investors who've been around for 20, 30 years, they have a lot of experience. But for them to now think quantitatively is going to be very hard because they've already... Uh, in the momentum of investing in a certain way. Mm. When we talk about the new generation, you need people who can decode markets, mm. stocks, sectors, everything in a process and granular aspect. And everybody does not possess the capability of understanding markets and uh, leading it back to a cause and effect relationship. Mm. Till you cannot build a cause and effect relationship and then convert it into a quantitative process, it's very hard. Mm. So even within quant, there are close to 1,50,000 methods of differentiating your strategy. Wow. So, so it's very, different very different. Different factors that you look at, fine. Let's dive straight into the style factors, right? You talk about size, quality, growth, volatility, value, and momentum. Tell us a little more about that. I mean, what are these factors? What are the different style factors? Okay. And as, a, as an investor, if I want to start investing in quant funds, what should I look at? Okay. So there are two questions, yeah. I'll handle them Okay, separately. let's go to the investing in quant funds later. First, okay. you tell us about the style factors. So, okay, quality is a very simple factor to understand. Everybody tells you in common sense that buy high quality companies. Yeah. So that's one aspect, that's one characteristic. Quality refers to leverage, return on capital, capital efficiency, a lot of other metrics which tell you that this is a high cash generating business, it does not need debt, it's capital light, it's capital efficient. Mm -hmm. That's what basically quality tells you. But Investing is not so simple because you need to get multiple things together. And the analysis we've done and probably shown, it tells you that using any single factor approach to investing will always underperform using a multi-factor approach to investing. Which means if you can blend quality, value, growth and momentum, the, you know that's a very, very powerful combination mm -hmm. as compared to only quality, only growth or only value. You cannot see things in isolation. Mm. And other than that, uh, the factors of growth basically include how a particular company is growing compared to its own history, mm. compared to rest of the companies in India, and compared to its sectoral peer set. Mm. When you get that, you understand that this company is growing well. Mm. Valuation again tracks uh, the value of a company related to its history, mm. related to its peers, and related to, it, related to its industry. And okay. like that, when you combine so many different data sets, you can build models that help you navigate changing regimes, changing styles, and changing macros. Okay, so this is very interesting, you know, because when you talk about just quality, right? I mean, look at names like, say, an ITC, an HDFC bank, an Asian Pains. If you take a last decade, these guys have not performed at all. A great quality company is bluest of blue chip names, exactly. right? Exactly. Okay. But so then, quality doesn't guarantee performance. Quality it doesn't guarantee. It guarantees protection of capital. But even value doesn't guarantee performance, right? I mean, PSU banks, for example, for the last decade have, have had great value in them. Valuations exactly. have been low, but they've done nothing for a decade. And, and now, now they've started to perform. Because it's a regime change. The regime change is a monetary cycle is changing. The inflation cycle is changing, the growth cycle is changing, and the credit cycle in terms of NPAs is changing. But how does an AI pick up, how does a machine learning It's very pick simple. Up a it's regime honestly change? very simple. So uh, there's a factor, we have, it's a proprietary factor called theme. Okay. So what our analysis tells us is that when you get the theme right, mm. your probability of generating positive returns is more than 70%. So to find the worst stock in the best theme, is better than the best stock in the worst theme, to put it very simply. Okay, it. So if you get your theme right, 
that PSU bank long is your theme. If your model captures that, then whichever stock you get is going to do better than a private bank. So are you trying to say that your model can capture the PSU bank theme, yes. but a the human emotion can't? No, I'm trying People to say like in general. Okay, last decade, they've not done anything. Why should we look at them? They are capital destroyers. They are not capital efficient. Yes. Emotions come in, biases come in, past experiences come in. The moment you take all that out and let the data talk, the model will tell you, okay, there is valuation in this. The monetary regime is indicating that you prefer a value investing style rather than a growth investing style. So for the last year, growth has delivered as a factor, has delivered negative 22% returns. Value has delivered positive 23% returns. So this is a shift in regime. So now all the growth investors will be like, I picked the best stock, yeah. but you got your regime wrong. Now you're done. So are you saying that fund managers who run active mutual funds they don't consider all of these put together, value, growth, theme, they do that, right? I mean, that's their basic job. So They do that, how but is not with the scientific rigor and the disciplined process that is needed. Because see, sizing, yeah. stock selection, regime selection, factor selection, sector identification, exiting, there are liquidity risk. There are multiple things that go into making investment returns. Mm -hmm. It's not so simple that I identified one good stock and now I'm going to make money. No. Mm -hmm. If I allocated 1% of my portfolio or 20% of my portfolio, that is going to differentiate the alpha. So when your machine is trained to take all these decisions in a very top-down, structured, scientific manner, the outcomes are more predictable, they are more consistent, and they are more reliable. As a human, I might react differently in different situations to the same data, mm. but a machine will not break uh, the mold. That's are you trying to say that fund managers are going to be jobless? Like traditional fund managers, if they don't keep up with the corn strategy. No, I'm not trying to say that. There'll always be a market, but US does suggest that. Computers are managing more money than humans. Passive, so the pecking order in US in terms of growth and market share over the last decade, so quant has grown at a 19% CAGR over the last decade in terms of AUM. Passive has grown at a 12% CAGR and active has degrown at a 2% CAGR. So there are multiple reasons, right? Performance, alpha, cost of that performance, subjectivity of that performance. Because usually, how does anybody select a fund? Is it performing well in the past? I think it should perform well in the future. Absolutely. So in the last three years, if a quality fund manager has done well, everybody will be like, let's put here. The cycle has changed. Now stick in quality for three years, wait till you get your cycle back. Absolutely. So there's a lot of pain once you enter the wrong regime. Okay, so that you've convinced me about quant <laughs> funds you have. And for all of you uh, who are doing like active fund management or who are into sort of active mutual funds, guys, the tide is turning and perhaps quant funds are the future. Let's do one thing. Let's slip into a short commercial break. Don't go anywhere. We'll come back with our guest in just a bit and talk more about quant investing, which is the future of investing. Stay tuned. Welcome back. A very interesting discussion with Siddharth Vora, who's the head investment <coughs> strategy and fund manager PMS at Prabhuda Siladar. He also heads the quant business there. And we're talking about quant investing, which is definitely the future of investing. Okay, before the break, Siddharth, you were telling us about uh, the do's and don'ts yeah. in quant investing. But tell us, what are the different kind of strategies and how do I build my corpus based on quant investing? Sure. So there are multiple strategies uh, one can construct uh, using a quantitative approach. Uh, to start with, uh, asset allocation, like dynamic asset allocation is a very important global category which is run on quantitative basis. Uh, the second one is a long-only equity category where you buy stocks and ride them without hedging it. So it's a long-only category. The third one is uh, the absolute return or a long-shot category mm -hmm. where you have to make money irrespective of whether markets are going up or down. Mm. So you have to basically create a long short portfolio in order to make money on both sides of the market. Mm. So these are the three broad categories the way we see it. Asset allocation, long only equity and long short slash absolute return. Uh, within this, uh, within long only category, uh, the way we are going about uh, evolving our strategies and products, we look at a top down approach that first you get the asset allocation right because asset allocation drives 91% of investment returns cross cycle period. Second, you get your regime right. Is it a value regime? Is it a growth regime? Is it a quality regime? Then you get your themes right. Then you get your factors right. Mm -hmm. And then you get your stock portfolio. So there are multiple decisions that a model needs to make for you. Mm -hmm. So within the long only category, we try to make all these decisions using our quantitative research models. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I think for an investor, a healthy mix of an asset allocation portfolio and a long only portfolio will help them navigate rough cycles also with good amount of fees. And if you know this, is, everybody's saying it, so am I, and my belief is there that this is the year of asset allocation. Yeah. The macros are challenging, the inflation is challenging, the growth is slowing down, the monetary cycle is not what we experienced for the last 16 years. Mm. So there is a big change. In times like this, where there's tremendous uncertainty, asset allocation is literally the only answer to protect capital first and generate alpha later. Okay, so uh, before I ask you about asset allocation, how is quant investing different from, I mean, I know basically how it's different from passive funds, passive fund right. investing. But, you know, if I say that I want to remove all kind of biases, right, familiarity, right. behavioral bias, I just go and invest in an index fund. Right. It moves with the index, it takes care of all the biases. So why should I then go ahead and, you know, use a quant fund? Very good question, Sonia. So passive funds are basically mimicking an index. Mm. And the advantage of a passive fund is that it's low cost. You don't need to worry whether the fund manager who does not want to buy metal stocks, real estate stocks, will be able to invest in them. Mm. Because when metal stocks do well, they rally 300% and your portfolio doesn't have it. So in that way, passive funds are effective. But the basis of quantitative investing starts with alpha, which means if you cannot generate alpha in a strategy across regimes, the quant strategy does not work. Mm. So once you invested one, one and a half year in building a single strategy, the outcome of that has to be cross-cycle alpha. Mm. Only then it justifies uh, managing public money. Mm. Otherwise, you cannot manage public money if you cannot generate alpha over passive funds. And our uh, research shows us that on an average, when you do asset allocation right, or you get the regime right, or you get the theme right, or you get the factors right, average alpha over a 10-year cycle is 12%. Okay. CAGR basis. Wow. So that's quite that, a bit. That's a significant alpha. Okay, since you said that the big, the first thing that you need to do is asset allocation, right. what do you think the asset allocation strategy should be this year? I'm asking you because, you know, I was doing a piece on gold. And I realized that in five out of the last seven recessions, gold has given positive returns. Absolutely. If you look at the last one year, five years, ten years, gold has outperformed the Sensex. So, should you raise gold in your asset allocation That's strategy? a very relevant question and I might want to give a disclaimer. I'm actually managing a multi-asset fund okay. in which uh, we've increased our gold allocation from 7% to north of 20% wow. over the last three months. Okay. And that has helped us obviously mitigate uh, all the volatility around equities. And our strategy is uh, currently, it's 51% equities, 21% gold, and the balance in debt funds. And within debt, we are gradually shifting from short duration to gilt. So for the last two years, we were positioned more in short duration and zero in uh, long duration. And now we are gradually moving towards long duration as we feel that the rate hike cycle might be nearing an end or a visible end. Hmm. So that is our strategy, but obviously as things change, as data changes, we might change our asset allocation also. Okay, we have a couple of minutes left. So anything sure. else you want to talk about in terms of size, performance, uh, of, uh, you know, the data for quant in India, what has it been in the past? Just for people who perhaps have never had any exposure to the quant side of investing. Sure, so I think uh, the most uh, glaring data is that 0.35% of assets managed in India are managed using quantitative techniques. In USA, this is north of 35%. Wow. So that is the opportunity, that is the potential. And other than that, quant and passive combined in USA carry more than 85% market share. Okay. So as the world moves towards a more sophisticated way of investing, I think India also has to be a part of that. And we have a, a, a stat here. In yeah. the United States, there's a 12% growth that quant funds have seen from 2014 to 2019. Do you have any such stat for India as well? Okay, so in India, the numbers are actually ridiculous because it's more like 100% CAGR yeah. because the base is extremely very, very small. Low. So on a 100 crore AUM, if you go to 1,000 crore AUM, uh, I think the industry size has gone from close to uh, 800 crores pan-India quant to close to 24,000 crores in the last five years. Wow. So that's a huge jump. But CAGRs will be misleading because the base is very, very low. Okay. And b before we let you go, anything else that we've sort of missed out on in terms of what the ideal strategy should be in terms of quant investing? Uh, the ideal strategy is never to focus on any one aspect of investing. 
it's to blend the multiple aspects of investing and follow a disciplined process time and again because whether you look at McDonald's, whether you look at MNCs, whether you look at Google, only processes can outlast people. Mm -hmm. And even in the Indian movie industry, you're seeing that content is now doing better than a star-driven movie. Yes. The audience is, is changing their preference to see the big actor versus seeing a content-driven movie. And when processes start uh, triumphing humans, I think even the investors will realize to choose a more rigorous process, a more intuitive process than trusting past performance of any fund manager. It's quite scary, right? I mean, to think of a time when robots or when machines this is not are going robots. to just take over. But I get your point. I get, get your point. For an average investor, how do I get started on my journey in, in quant investing? Okay, so there are multiple ways uh, from mutual funds to PMSs to AIFs to small cases. But the idea is these are just platforms where you can find uh, quantitative investment products, but how to evaluate the right strategy for you is very, very important. And I think uh, we look at five things before evaluating if the strategy is good or no. One is what is the objective of a strategy? Is it alpha generation? Is it uh, absolute returns? Is it uh, relative outperformance? What is the real purpose? Then the architecture. How is this strategy designed? Is it a ML-driven model? Usually, artificial intelligence and ML-driven models, they are black box in nature, which means the fund manager also doesn't know the rules okay. because it's self-evolving. So when a model buys or sells something, you don't know. But that is not the approach we follow. We follow the rules-based, process-driven approach where every decision, every success, every failure can be attributed to why this happened. Mm. I have a cause and effect relationship for every decision in our models. So again, the idea is understand the architecture. Is it a math model? Is it a quantum mental rules-based model? Is it a ML-driven black box model? Or is it a passive model? What is it? Then you start looking at the performance characteristics of a strategy. And it's not only returns. It's returns, volatility, standard deviation, sharp ratio, Sortino ratio. These are some ways to evaluate on a cross-cycle basis, how does a model perform? Mm. How, what kind of drawdowns can it give in a bad cycle? What kind of alpha can it generate in a good cycle? Okay. And after that, finally, you look at things like fees and potential investment outcomes, and then you select the right product for you. Okay, Siddharth, it was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much. I didn't realize how half an hour passed. <laughs> I mean, it was a really informative, you know, a sort of primer on how to do quant investing. But folks, uh, if you have any feedback, please write into us. We have to wrap up on this session of Smart Money. Thanks a lot for watching and have a great weekend.